Uh, first of all, let's thank the board and Priscilla for the great job they've done in setting all of this up and getting this together. We're going to jump right in. Eschatology. I tell my students that when they teach and preach in the church, they shouldn't use $3 seminary words. That just is one of those things we do to try and make ourselves look smart and we can use regular five cent words and do just fine. But one of those words, one of those three dollar words that I think every person in the pew ought to know is eschatology. The reason I think you need to know it is because it is so important in the New Testament. Every page has eschatology on it. Almost every paragraph has eschatology, or a, a related term you may have heard, apocalyptic worldview. Eschatology comes from the Greek word eschaton. So now we all know what this means, right? Eschaton is the Greek word for the end. So eschatology, uh, the ology part, study of, etc. Uh, but eschatology is language about, ideas about, stories about, etc. The end of time. The end with a capital E. We live some 2,000 years after the time of Christ. And we don't worry about eschatology that much anymore. Those first Christians thought Jesus would return within a matter of days, weeks, years. And, and we've gone a long ways from that. So we don't sit, most of us, at the window looking for Jesus to come surfing in on the clouds any morning. Just wondering if today's the day. But if you're ever up at like 3 o'clock in the morning and you turn on the TV, you see there are plenty of preachers who are still saying that's exactly what's about to happen. Ooh, did you see this in the news? That is a sign related to Revelations 4.22 that says, with the Russian buildup in this area, Jesus is about to come back, so you need to send me your money. Right? That's the way that always works. Give me your money right before the time comes. Um, you may remember um, around the, the change of the millennium, that there was lots of talk. Evidently, everybody thinks God likes round numbers. So the time was going to come to an end, and there were all kinds of projections about that. And in fact, it was such a big deal that there were people who um, tried to make money off it in different ways. So there was this one service. I, I just, just love the creativity of this kind of con. There was this one service that said, we expect to be left behind. So we'll take care of your pets when you're gone. So if you go on and set up a fee now, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do it. So people gave their money to this thing. Um, in today's worldview, we live by a one day at a time, sweet by and by kind of outlook. We've turned that world-ending eschatology over the course of thousands of years into a view of my eschatology. When I die, I go to heaven. Right? So that kind of, that's not what we're talking about today. We want to go back and look at Matthew's view of eschatology and see what we can make of it today without getting caught up in the sort of hokey kind of thing of trying to predict the moment and the time. So to give you an idea of how thoroughly eschatological our traditional language is and we don't notice it, let's talk about the Lord's Prayer. Every line of the Lord's Prayer almost is eschatological. So how does it start? Our Father where? Okay, so there is this assumption at the beginning that God is not here. Our Father who is distant, right? Now, that doesn't mean there's no way in which God is present. But there's a recognition that God is transcendent, separate from us. So, part of eschatological expectation is God will come. It's always been part of it. Our Father who is in heaven, you know, we'd say who art in heaven. What's the next line? Okay, what does that mean? You say that every week. What does that mean? Just holy as God? It's, notice the tense. 
hallowed be thy name. It's actually future. It is, our translations don't do it perfectly, but it's may your name become holy. Now, in the ancient world, there were strong lines dividing a clean, beneath unclean, and above holy. Now, we can get all lost in that in today's world because we don't understand those kind of purity codes and we think they mean morality and stuff they didn't. Think of them like germs. So, clean is just when you're going around feeling pretty healthy. You get a cold, you got a little sneeze, you're contagious, you're unclean. The whole idea of this system is to keep the holy separate because being unclean is incredibly contagious. So if a woman was, had her menstrual period or you had touched a dead relative, you were unclean. You became unclean for all kinds of reasons in the ancient world. You were probably unclean more often than you were clean. But the idea was before you would go to temple, before you would go to synagogue, you, you've got to get yourself clean again. So often when you got unclean, it just meant you had to wash your hands in a certain way and you were clean again because it's a ritual cleanness. So when we pray, hallowed be thy name, it's a prayer that God may stay holy and separate from the uncleanness that we represent and that the world represents. So it's, it's highlighting that transcendence of God even more. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay, now boom, this is where we get into the eschatology most explicitly. Thy kingdom come... Every ancient Jew prayed, may the Messiah come daily. Thy kingdom, we're going to talk about the kingdom in a little bit, God's reign. The prayer that that kingdom come is to pray for the end of time. We may not hear it that way, but that's what the prayer meant. For God's kingdom to come meant the eradication of life as we know it. And while that sounds horrible when I say eradicate life, ancient people who were oppressed would hear that as a good thing. The eradication of evil, the eradication of power structures that keep some on top and some below, that kind of thing. So when we pray thy kingdom come, we are praying for a radical shift in the whole of existence. The end of everything as we know it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Um, thy kingdom come. What's the next line? Keep going. That's not the whole line. Okay, so we've already in the prayer set up this dichotomy between God in heaven and the need for the kingdom to come on earth. So now the prayer goes further as to what it means to pray for the end to come. To pray for the kingdom to come is that God's will be fully done on earth as it already is done in heaven apart from us. So it's a prayer for God to come and make God's will be done. There's all those lines about Jesus will, uh, people will bow at Jesus' feet. Oh, that's subordination language. It's not happy praise. Will, will, no, no, it's like victory language that we miss in today's world. So this is language of you come, eradicate evil, and make your will of justice, peace, love, make it happen on earth. Give us today. Okay, translations here are a little hard and all. This, of course, refers back to the manna. When we are completely dependent on God for our existence. And everyone is on equal terms. Nobody gets to have more manna than the next person because at the end of the day, what happens to it? Spoils, rots, whatever. So in this case, this is a prayer in a sense for equality in the world. May all have the bread they need for the day. Um, eschatological overturning. Forgive us. Yeah, it depends on what your denomination is, isn't it, as to how you say this line. Um, debts is probably the one closest to the Matthean version, but forgive us our debts. And ha What's the next part of the line, though? Oh, that's the line we hate, right? We'd really much rather say, 
let us forgive as you forgive. But that is not what the line says. So this is a judgment line. Judge us on the basis of which we judge others. Forgive us as we forgive others. So we often mistake in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, um, before you judge someone else, take the, you know, the log out of your own eye before you judge the speck in theirs. Notice, we often say it means you shouldn't judge. That is not what it says. It absolutely says you have to judge. Part of being human is to judge. But don't judge hypocritically. Don't judge in a way you don't want to be judged by. Don't withhold forgiveness in a way you don't want to be forgiven. This is a prayer about eschatological judgment. So in, in the story of the Exodus, when the people... Remember, the, 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 sla- the Israelite slaves leave Egypt. They're all excited until they get to the wilderness and they no longer have their salad bars. So they're out there, and what are we going to do? And so um, they start complaining, we don't have this, we don't have that. And so God, uh, Moses goes and takes the complaints to God, and God gives them manna, and the manna falls fresh on the ground every morning, and they are instructed to collect only as much as they need for the day, except when there's Paso, uh, except for when there's the Sabbath the next day, but only as much as they want for the day. Some try to gather more, and it rots. So the claim, is, notice it's not um, simply um, give me my bread for the day. It's give us our daily bread. So in that us, that plural, this whole prayer is plural, is praying that the world might have the bread it needs. And just what it needs. Not my manna for the day and my TV and my car and my, right? So this is an ascent, but it's also where we don't have to fight for manna. The equality, there's no more struggle because everybody has what they need. So does that help? Is that okay? Um, the last line is the eschatological exclamation point. How does it go? Lead us. But. Okay. And then we add the, the sort of doxological thing at the end. But actually that is not what it says. We pray that line incorrectly. In the Greek, it is... Lead us not into the temptation and deliver us from the evil one. Now, see, that has a really different sound to it. And you can see why over the ages, as we are less superstitious people and those kinds of things, we've moved away to make that language more abstract. But there was an assumption that the, the, the temptation, the trial was coming. That was part of the eschatological overturning. Of the, so bring us out of judgment. Help us avoid the judgment. And deliver us from Satan. And in this view, Satan is not the little tempter, not the little red devil we picture. Satan is God's apocalyptic um, enemy battling for the fate of the world. So the whole temptation story, for instance, is about Jesus taking on. It's an apocalyptic battle. But, but it doesn't sound that way in the 21st century. But that's the way first century people would have heard it. So our prayer is that you pray probably almost every Sunday is thoroughly eschatological. You are praying for the end of the world every Sunday when you pray that. You just didn't know it. The whole New Testament is eschatological in that fashion, and we don't notice it. Because our ears aren't tuned to it in the same way. And because we don't live under the oppressive power of Caesar and the Roman Empire, so we are not worried about it in the same way. There is a um, a story of this uh, global music festival that was going on, global Christian music festival. And so our goal is going to be to get to look at what Matthew specifically thought. And I would agree, Matthew does not think there will be an end 
literal to the world that it destroys. And said they see it as an overturning of the age. Matthew sees an overturning of the age. Um, that's not as clear with Revelation or, say, 1 Thessalonians. Um, what they, Paul and the author of Revelation might mean something slightly different. But... Remember, this is the early ages of Christianity, so there was not one consensus view. you got to remember, a lot of our translations are related to the King James Version. We are heirs to it. Um, and in the Enlightenment age, we, especially 19th century and all, we just tried to erase all that eschatological thought out of the New Testament. So in the 19th century, there were all these biographies of Jesus written. By, by New Testament scholars. Um, this was the early day of biblical scholarship as we think of scholarship today. And they all look like good, all the Jesuses look like good liberal 19th century theologians. And then Albert Schweitzer, heard of Albert Schweitzer, he was also a biblical scholar. He wrote a book called The Quest for the Historical Jesus. And he went through biography after biography and showed how the theologian had basically projected himself into the image of Jesus, his own theology. And he said, no, what we have in Jesus is a radical apocalyptic figure who doesn't look anything like our theology today. Now, there were problems with Schweitzer's book. It was written in the 20s. And um, so uh, there's been a lot of scholarship since then. But his basic view that we have misunderstood the apocalyptic parts of the Bible, especially the New Testament, has held on. So it is a radical different way than, than the way we usually say it. Oh, I shouldn't have called him. <laughs> I'm kidding. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Was there another question? I'll try to do better with that. Okay. So the point to hold on to at the moment, because we haven't even gotten to Matthew yet, right, is just that the early Christians were thoroughly eschatological, and the New Testament writers were eschatological in their worldview. Um. And we can't, we can't exaggerate that when we talk about the New Testament. There is no way to overstate how thoroughly eschatological and apocalyptic the New Testament is. We just miss it. And I'll bet your pastors don't mention it a whole lot because it's not part of our core theology. So one of the questions becomes, okay, we don't hold on to that ancient worldview in quite that same way. So what do we do with that foreign language? And I think Matthew's going to offer us some keys for that. But I want to back up before we move to Matthew yet and talk about a key concept of eschatology in the Gospels, well, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because we've got to have this concept in hand before we can move forward. And that concept is God's reign, God's dominion, the kingdom of God, or in Matthew it's often the kingdom of heaven. These are all synonymous terms. So first of all, let me say why I don't use the word kingdom as much. One is it's a, it's a male term, king, but that's okay in terms of the ancient translation. What's not quite right is kingdom seems to imply, you know, like a geographical area. God rules over this area. But really the, the, the word basileia in Greek is more dynamic than that. It, it means more God's rule, that kind of thing. So, to understand the import of this term, because often I think our modern ears hear kingdom of heaven, and we think of going to heaven. Kingdom of God is otherworldly. It is not that at all. Structuralism is, is a philosophy of language that teaches us that every term we use has meaning in the relationship with other terms, right? So there's a structure. And one of those primary structures is opposites. So it contrasts. Yes has a certain meaning only when contrasted with no. So for instance, if I ask you, what does the word woman mean? If I say you are a woman, what am I saying? Maybe. What? So if I'm contrasting you to him, I'm saying you're, you're female. But what if I say she is a woman, not a girl? See, now the meaning is about age, right? So 
What, what a term means only makes full sense over against some other word in context. So the question becomes, what is the contrast for God's reign that the ancient writers understood implicitly to be there? We often think kingdom of heaven is, means something like immortal life versus mortal life. That's not what they meant by it. Their contrast was kingdom of God over against kingdom of Caesar. It is a political term. I know some of you think politics has no place in the, the, in the church or in the pulpit, but I got to tell you, it's all through your Bible. If there's eschatology, which I've said is everywhere, then there's politics. Because it's a this-worldly worry about the end of the ages. So, the ancient Christians, most of them, uh, Jewish Christians, early Gentile Christians, were not the upper-class citizens of the empire. Some had money, some didn't, etc. But they were not those in power. Especially those from the Jewish sect who were a conquered people. These are the Syrian refugees of the ancient world in some ways. So when they hear Jesus say, the kingdom of God is at hand, they hear a political statement. Our plight is about to be overcome. It is not, when I die, I'll go to heaven. It is this world is on the wrong track and God will overturn it. So God stands over against the political evil forces of the world. The kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of Caesar are the same in this ancient worldview. Oppressive power on that side. God's power of justice, equality, peace on this side. What we know of any regime politically is nobody gives up power willingly. When we pray thy kingdom come, we are praying that God comes and takes over the world. It's a hard thing to hear. In, in the Magnificat in Luke 2, Luke 2 um, when Mary is praying after she has received word that she will give birth to the Christ, she prays eschatologically that the, the weak be lifted up by the strong being taken down. The ancients didn't see it as a sense that we could just give everyone manna. They knew for some to get manna who didn't have it, others had to give it up. There's an ancient medieval quote that says, the extra coat in my closet is taken off the back of someone who doesn't own one. The ancient eschatological worldview is one of creating a level playing field for all. So eschatology in the New Testament is thoroughly sociological, political, as well as theological. It is communal, not individual. It's not about my fate. It's about the fate of the world. So one of the big struggles to figure out is, given that kind of view, what does that mean? What are we supposed to do as Christians? How are we to live in this? So remember, we, we keep talking about eschatology as th this future orientation. But that's only one side of the coin. Early Christians saw the, the birth, ministry, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ as an eschatological event. It was the turning of the ages. It's not simply that we are waiting for the end of the age. The end of the age has already begun in their view. So what is, is completely... Um, thoroughly eschatological is a view that's often described as already, not yet. 
It is this tension that describes eschatological existence. We already, we here in this room, we wouldn't be here on a Saturday morning and afternoon spending six hours together if we hadn't experienced something of God's love and grace. The reason we want to continue studying Scripture this way is we've experienced salvation. We, that doesn't mean we're holy there, but we're not perfect people. But we are so changed by that, that it reorients our individual lives. However, we are people who watch the news. And when we watch the news, we know not everyone is experiencing that same salvation we are. We see young African Americans killed by police, and we see police protecting African Americans marching being killed by a sniper. And, and, in my town in Dallas. We see Syrian refugees being killed in their own country and being accused of being terrorists anywhere else they go. They're trapped. We see radical economic differences uh, between us and people living in the global south. So, I mean, I may not be the richest person in the world. In fact, you know, when we look at our new president and his um, pool of uh, appointees, they represent huge amounts of money, and I feel like I'm a pretty poor guy. But then I look to the global south, and I recognize I have access to credit they don't have. We've, we've got more bathrooms in the U.S. than is spread around the rest of the world. We are incredibly rich, which gives us a little pause when it comes to this eschatological talk because we're not always going to be on the good side of the overturning of tables.